Thank you, Donald. It's a great pleasure today to get to visit with Howard Kern. Howard's the CEO of the Sentara Health System and, and one of the most extraordinary healthcare executives I've ever had a chance to visit with. We're going to talk today about healthcare leadership, about the robotic system and the robotic, uh, what, what they've done, and a lot more. Howard, can you take a moment? You're one of the great CEOs in the country. Take a moment, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about the Sentara Health System. Thanks, Scott. It's really a pleasure to be with you today. I want to start by also sharing how much we appreciate the great information and news that Becker's brings to us at Sentara. We read it regularly, and it's an important part of how we stay informed. So thank you. I've been with Sentara now 42 years. I came to Sentara pretty much out of graduate school and have really grown up in the organization. Sentara has been uh, serving Virginia about 130 years. So it goes back to the yellow fever epidemics that plagued the ports in Hampton Roads back then. And uh, having grown up with the organization, it's a really been a special experience to understand the culture and the values that had uh, driven the organization's success. Uh, and I would say that uh, today, Sentara is what it is because of the leadership of a lot of great people. Uh, with our hospitals, we have 12 hospitals that serve pretty much across the state of Virginia. Uh, we have several physician groups. We have a health plan that serves about 950,000 people, including 600,000 Medicaid members in Virginia. And that covers really the entire state of Virginia. So Sentara is very much a statewide organization. We have one hospital in North Carolina uh, and uh, really have focused on uh, meeting the community needs for a long time. It, it, and Howard, when I had a chance to visit you for the first time in some depth, probably 10, 15 years ago now, I was uh, uh, sort of inspired by this focus on patient quality, focus on patient experience, innovation. It, you were so clear that the driving force behind Sentira were going to be patient quality and experience and innovation, as opposed to necessarily just growth for growth sake or mergers and acquisitions for mergers and acquisitions sake, but really a core focus on quality and patient experience. How did you come to make that such a clear focus of the Sentara organization? And what drove you towards that clarity of, of leadership? That's a great question, Scott. I think from my perspective, the value we create and, and provide in the communities we serve are first and foremost about great quality of care and great experience for our customers. And it doesn't matter how much you want to aspire to growth. If you can't deliver on that value proposition and promise uh, to your customers, then you don't have any business uh, trying to grow. Uh, so we set out to do that very early on. And when I took over, and yeah, I think my predecessor also had a major focus there. But I would say also that you aren't going to make those things happen without a great team. And one of the first things I did uh, when I took over was really set about creating a, a fantastic leadership team with diverse perspectives and, and insights that could come together and really function as a team. There are no individual superstars here. We all work as a team and are driving towards great results in quality, customer experience and innovation as you've focused on. A quick word about innovation. We have participated in very innovative technologies and, and have led certain innovative technologies. Uh, going back to the you know the early 2000s with patient focused care and the EICU, one of the things we've learned is that our expertise and our strength isn't in creating new widgets or or fancy get digital technologies, uh, but really process design innovation has really driven our focus as an organization. We believe that the key to success in quality and customer experience is the ability to repeat, repeatedly deliver on high quality and service experience with reliability. And to do that, you have to have standardization. Unwanted variation is the enemy of quality and service. Uh, so that's been a core part of the way, what we've done and how we've done it. Uh, we have something that we have worked on across the years that really is driven through the ability and, in my mind, the promise of an integrated delivery system, which is to transition that kind of promise towards reliability and consistency across the entire enterprise between the health plan and the hospitals and the doctor's offices. So that's the, probably the newest and most important uh, level of challenge that we're working on now. 
You've also developed, as, as part of your efforts, one of the most advanced robotics programs in the nation. I think you've got eight or so Da Vinci robots. Talk a bit about data, the importance of data, and, and how is the data that Intuitive provides helped to better understand the reality and the cost and strategy? How has that data been helpful? Talk a little bit about that in the context of uh, the Da Vinci robot program. Sure, Scott. Uh, first of all, I'd say DaVinci has been a real partner with us, and they have been at the, at the table helping us with data analytics development, helping us to define metrics and benchmarks, and, and work on the process innovation elements that I talked about earlier. We have eight systems, and we're in the process of looking at installing two additional systems to address growth and, and technology diversification with robotics. Uh, the, the data analytics piece really focuses on performance against uh, key areas that really drive the value proposition for robotics. Reduce complications, reduce mortality, improve length of stay, in, improve satisfaction, improved you know, performance from the surgeon's perspective. Uh, and these areas are where we're trying to measure and, and really validate that we're getting the value out of robotics. And frankly, we are. We're seeing meaningful performance differentiation on areas like think to stay or mortality and complications. And uh, those numbers you know, really speak to the, the advantage, not just of robotics and interoperative, you know, minimally invasive surgery, but also the technology that Da Vinci brings to the table. We have other robots within our system, but I would tell you that Da Vinci is, you know, the Da Vinci volume is probably uh, several hundred times higher in terms of its scale in our system than the other robotic capabilities. And, and it's one of the most impressive programs across the system in the country. What, what is it, how do you manage it across the system? Is it managed hospital by hospital? Is it managed across the entire service line? How, how do you manage the robotics program? And how does it impact how you look at things and your strategies for use of robotics? Early, early on in our process, it was managed hospital by hospital, and typically because of the surgeon motivation, surgeon by surgeon. Uh, today, we have a, a great service line model where the surgeons and the management and the clinical staff all sit in the room together and look at the needs and the plans and the uh, demand models. And, and we actually have involved uh, da Vinci in that process to a certain extent to help us identify where we need to develop technology, where we need to deploy the robots to meet the needs and, and make sure we're not over creating capacity or uh, under developing where we need it. So it's a service slide driven model with, as I mentioned before, the importance of standardizing processes, looking for the best practice, and then standardizing on it across the system. And talk a little bit about, let me ask you about standardization and how much effort over the years to get better and better at standardizing the robotics program as well as the other pro programs at, at Centera. How do you look at standardization? How important is that to quality of care? Yeah, we, we have institutionalized this notion of standardization. I'll tell you a quick story, and this is one of my favorites that goes back, it's not a Da Vinci issue, but it was more of a classic conundrum for a large health system. Uh, we have a, a board-led medical affairs committee, and the board's been very engaged in quality, and that's a big part of how I've been able to get the engagement from the medical staffs and, and uh, across the organizations. We've got great board leadership that has focused on quality. And at one of these board medical affairs quality meetings, uh, there was a, a notice that we were having problems with urology infections. So we went I had, had several of our infectious disease specialists uh, look at this, and of course they identified the use of Foley catheters and the amount of time it takes to remove Foley catheters as a variation that was causing uh, infections in, in patients that had them in too long. So this infectious disease team working with the urology team developed a ideal model for how we ought to establish removal of Foley catheters uh, in patients that had them installed, whether they were pro-stop or for other reasons. It took us over a year, and I think it was 28 different medical staff committees to get approval of that one policy. And the learning I had after that was that we need to create a different structure. The, the notion of a balkanized, each hospital having its own executive committee and quality committee and credentialing committee is very clunky and slow and, and really was giving us some real 
uh, challenges in terms of everybody parochially looking at these issues individually. So we sort of turned the organization on its side and said, we're going to have uh, quality and performance standardization be virtual across the organization. And we're going to put together clinical leaders on a committee, which includes nurses, doctors, other clinical staff working together uh, to identify system-based policies and approve them one time. And uh, I remember my chief medical officer at the time saying, this is never going to work. The medical staff's going to revolt. But, you know, the physician leaders saw the value in this, and they got behind it and supported it significantly. And today, that same committee still meets. And that's, I'm, we've been doing this for about six years. And uh, there's incredible engagement and discussion. These policies, when they get presented there, they've already been vetted by important players in the organization, but they come there and it's a fun, whatever the final decision is made, that's the decision for how we're gonna do it across the system. And that has worked to really engage and facilitate the process for us. And that I assume has really improved provider satisfaction, patient experience, yeah. outcomes, clinical outcomes and so forth, that synergization yeah. is so, so important. Talk a little bit about, a couple areas are hard to measure. Sometimes it's hard to measure provider satisfaction, patient experience, a handful of these things are a little bit more amorphous than actually numbers yeah. on number of infections and so forth. How do you sort of look at patient and provider experience, and how do you look at patient and provider experience in the context of the robotics program? Great question. And you know, just to speak generically, for most of us, we've looked at patient satisfaction and patient experience measured by HCAP scores, which is what Medicare requires for hospitals to do on a subset sampling of our patients. We use net provider you know, scores in other parts of our, net promoter scores, excuse me, in other parts of our organization, particularly the health plan. Uh, but I think in the future, as we look forward, we're focusing more on the, the broader definition of patient experience. And we, I see digital being a huge advocate for how do we create the, the, the approach to understanding the consumer, what they want, where they want it, how they want it. And, and more importantly, really understanding the consumer on a, on a deeper level. Too many times today, a patient comes in for a procedure, or comes in for a surgery or a hospitalization. We get to meet them when they come in and we say, you know, get take care of them, hopefully and they get a good result. And then we pat them on the back as they leave in the wheelchair and say, thank you very much. And there's no connectivity and no ongoing relationship built. So our goal is going to be to create a much longer term, longitudinal relationship with the the customer, the consumer, and really think about how do you create a, a customer for life? And that's really the way we see customer experience you know, in the future. It's really about connectivity to really understand where the customer is and what their wants are. Know more about them, frankly, than we do now. We know very little about our customers. And, and then be able to serve their broader needs with digital capabilities, maybe a little more retail in the long term. How this applies to robotics is interesting because I think the ability to create a robotic experience uh, for the future presents some interesting opportunities uh, to really enhance that customer experience by doing a lot of procedural con you know, potential in different settings. I mean, I think the home is going to be an important venue for care if we look out the next five years. Uh, certainly with the pandemic, you know, there's a lot of interest in trying to look at more remote and telemedicine. I think robotic surgery presents some interesting opportunities in that context. Uh, so it's really about creating a scenario where the technology can bring more to the consumer instead of making the consumer come to the hospital. And uh, we're very excited. There's some very innovative in vivo technologies that I think can also, in, me, in vivo meaning implant implantables in the body that can achieve a lot of the ro robotic capabilities that we've been doing with minimally invasive surgery. And Howard, let me ask you this question. You're this magnificent regional yep. system, become better and better. You've also got a lot of community hospitals, big and small hospitals. W would you say that the robotics program, the huge investment that you made in robotics and becoming a, whole, a total leader there, has allowed this entire system to strengthen its overall sort of eliteness, reputation, not to play above its weight, because you've got a magnificent weight as it is, but it's really helped enhance the quality of care and the reputation of the entire Centera system. A absolutely. There's no question about that, Scott. I think the reality for the consumer and the marketplace is technology is a, is a 
demonstration of your commitment to the customer and a demonstration of your sophistication as an organization. So community hospitals should be in the robotics business in minimally invasive surgery. It's an expectation of, of doing business in surgery today. And from Sentara's perspective, we moved away from having the robotics all in the tertiary quaternary centers uh, years ago. And uh, we really do see it as, as a fundamental part of delivering high quality surgical care in a community hospital. And so just really a magnificent ability to drive great community hospitals to play above what's considered their, their, their weight, but really just a, a, an extension of the quality of care and the, the cornerstone focus you have on quality of care and how you view that as being the absolute cornerstone of what Sentira does is quality of care and patient experience and clinical outcomes. Talk for a moment about Sentira also has its own insurance plans. Um, and and it, how does having a great robotics program tie into a minimally invasive surgery, tie into having your own insurance plan? And why is this such an important part of that effort as well? One of the important elements of investing in uh, robotics is the ability to drive costs lower uh, for your surgical procedures. Of course, there's an element of volume that you have to have if you're gonna make that kind of investment decision. But uh, you know, if you're working with a health plan, uh, whether you own it or you're partnering, uh, to the extent you can drive volume to a lower cost setting, create the uh, capabilities with technology like robotics, uh, the technology and the data show that your costs are, are substantially lower. We lo we're looking at costs in terms of length of stay in the operating room, length of stay overall for care, being on the order of about 15 to 20% lower. And to the extent you can you know, manage that with a payer, through lower rates, you know, especially for predictive surgeries like uh, urologic cases and, and orthopedics and, and, and back cases in neurosurgery, you have, you have the real potential to compete uh, for providing high quality care at a lower cost, which is really, I think, the end point everybody wants. Better access, better affordability, but not giving up on the quality. You've always struck me as one of the most thoughtful and inspiring leaders in healthcare. You're a person who doesn't um, just handles themselves like a like a true leader. It brings out the best in others. Has built great teams. Truly, an inspiring and thoughtful person. Um, what do you sort of see as you look at the next five, ten years? What does the future of healthcare look like? And what are you most excited about, Howard? What What do you look into the future and say, "This is what I'm really excited about. This is where we're going." That's a really interesting question. Uh, I'm going to go in a couple of different directions, uh, and as I think about how to answer that, I would tell you that probably some of the things that I'm seeing on the horizon that I'm the most excited about, and I think have the greatest potential to drive dramatic improvements in the in the customer's experience and in the value proposition we talked about earlier. One is digital. I think everybody thinks about digital in the context of of you know getting online and and doing telehealth or or creating a digital front door. I think it's much deeper than that. And it's really looking at the sophistication that both retail, you know, like Amazon or Walmart has created with their digital functionality and the way they, they deliver to the customer, uh, both products and services, in a way that, that really makes it easy and effective for the customer and gives the customer what they want when they want it. Uh, finance is another great example. The finance industry and banking uh, we've evolved from having to stand in line waiting for a teller to using an ATM machine. Now, very few of us actually do that. We're online you know, doing our financial transactions uh, you know, digitally. Those kind of capabilities will transform healthcare, I'm convinced, in the next three to five years. The other area that I, I'm struck by that uh, as we're doing an update to our strategic plan today, Scott, is the reality that workforce is going to be a major challenge and a priority for us in the future. Uh, both training the right kind of workforce, clinical staff, support staff, as well as how to manage uh, the work setting. Because of what we've learned with the pandemic, we're in many areas, you know, hybrid in terms of having people working from home, working in, a, in an office setting, coming into meetings and having work sessions, problem sessions, but then going home and, and implementing. And how do you do that and maintain your culture, maintain you know, your connection with your customers, 
uh, when so much of it's remote or, or virtual. Uh, the third area which strikes me as something that I'm, it's one of the things I'm most proud about and I'm most excited about is, you know, the reality that the pandemic exposed uh, in our society today is the dramatic problems in health equity and social determinants. I think we knew about some of those things uh, before the pandemic, but I think the pandemic showed up in with a bright light uh, areas where, you know, uh, in ethnic diverse groups with, in underserved communities were having significantly worse outcomes than uh, more advanced and more uh, financially strong communities and uh, and different ethnic groups. And I think that points to a need for a number of priorities. One is an investment in improved you know, health information and, and health literacy, an element of better public health. If you think about the advancements in healthcare of the 1920s and 30s, it was all about public health. Very little of it was really um, medicine, practice in a doctor's office or in a hospital. And I think we're almost coming, you know, sort of back to that, if, if you would, uh, in the recognition that public health has been, you know, just cut and cut and cut and to the point where it's, it's in many communities, in most communities, I would say, its job is to grade restaurants and do medical examiner work. There's so much more to public health that could really improve health outcomes, and in many cases, more significantly than hospitals and doctors. Uh, there's much that's been written about 20% of what is really defining health outcomes is done in hospitals and in doctor's offices. 80% is a function uh, it, of that improvement is a function of genetics, healthier lifestyles, and public health. So I'm really excited about Centera's investment and commitment in those areas. Uh, we've invested, uh, we put $50 million of commitment up to focus on social determinants in, in 2019 and 2020. And we're doing things like nutritional support and housing and supportive housing and other range of, of behavioral services in the community. And then in, in this year, we've committed 50 million more uh, to be focused on the whole area of health equity and public health. And those are the kind of things that health systems really ought to be doing and investing in to really drive outcomes in their community. So those are the three things I'd, I'd tell you I'd focus on digital, I would focus on the, um, the importance of a workforce, and then this whole notion of uh, health equity and health social determinants. Uh, thank you very much. No, it's an, it's an amazing sort of combination of, of real focus on health equity, social determinants of health. The workforce challenges yeah. seem to be uh, daunting across the entire country. They're daunting pre the pandemic. With the pandemic, they've accelerated that almost in hyperdrive. Uh, and then the digitization, mm -hmm. the digital healthcare, the sort of getting pe people, the consumer experience they get from an Amazon, their bank, their Expedia's, everything else in the world, uh, such a focus. Howard, it's always a pleasure to visit with you. It's, it's, it's really amazing what you've done as a leader. I, I've seen it from day one, the first time I had a chance to talk with you and watch you present on quality. And it's been just a true north for you since you, since you started. We since you were CEO, but I'm sure for the 40 years, 30 years before that as well. It's a remarkable career, and it's an amazing investment and viewpoint on the robotic system and how important it's been to Centera uh, in its pursuit of greatness. So really, just a pleasure to visit with you. I, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll turn it now back to uh, Donald and the Intuitive team. Howard, always great to visit with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. I enjoyed the conversation.